Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, as introduced, my name is Nick Valesky, and I work for our USU Extension Integrated Pest Management Program. And I'm also currently a master's student in the plant, soil, and climate department here at USU studying high value crops. But a lot of my experience of work kind of the, these past few years has been involved in commercial vegetable production, um, plant pathology, entomology, pesticide application, and of course, general integrated pest management. So to get us started, I just wanna talk about kind of the theme of this expo that we have today. And that's kind of the growth of small scale agriculture here in Utah. Um, as we all know, there's rapid development in Utah, especially these past few years, and that's kind of caused this interest shift from traditional large scale farming to small urban scale farming. Um, but the USDA has a statistic um, that's kind of sad between 2012 and 2017, Utah lost over about 16,792 acres of farmland but the total farm number operations has actually increased where about 34% of these farms are between one and nine acres. And about 44% of these are run by individuals relatively new to farming. So this might be a category that you guys would consider yourselves. Um, and then kind of what I want to go into today is this interest in sustainable pest management. So I want to highlight some evidence showing that Utah small farmers have an interest and desire to learn more about pest management. In 2020, about three years back, my supervisor and I, we put together this survey, which we had about 3,250 individuals respond. And some of the interesting findings were that 45% indicated that they have an interest in general integrated pest management techniques. 54% want to learn more about specific insect identification and their management. 73% that said they'd like to better understand the natural enemies that we have in our agricultural landscape and how to promote them. Um, similarly, with USU Extension, we have a Facebook group that a lot of us manage. It's the Utah's Gardening Experts, and that has about 19,000 members. It's really grown these past few years. And my team and I, we regularly identify reoccurring questions and comments from clientele relating to non-chemical options to manage different arthropod and plant diseases. So I think all this information, I think there's strong evidence that Utahns have an interest in sustainable pest management. And either by choice or necessity, many small scale farmers are highly motivated to minimize their use of pesticides. And this can be for um, just personal preference or they have a commitment to using organic farming methods or they have a lack of access to suitable pesticides and the appropriate pack sizes, and or they might have restrictions and pesticide use in urban areas. So I wanna get down to it. And with my role with US, USU Extension, I get to teach farmers and gardeners about integrated pest management. So we call it IPM for short. Um, it's essentially a comprehensive approach to pest control that uses a combined means to reduce the status of a pest to tolerable levels while maintaining a quality environment. So there's a lot of different models indicating different thresholds and control actions for different pests, but ultimately it's up to you as the farmer to decide um kind of what works at your farm site um so you want to consider your farm farm size your labor the cost of pest control versus the potential profit which we'll get into and we'll talk about these things um as we go on but within the world of ipm we like to use this pyramid model so i designed one myself that i like 
And essentially it covers all the way that all the ways that we can manage pets and it falls into everything we can do falls into one of these four categories. And we organize it from the base of the pyramid of some of the common things we do most often all the way to the things like chemical control that we want to do um, the least often. So at the base, we have what we call cultural control tactics. So these are practices that are applied over a long period of time that are aimed at reducing and avoiding pest problems. So these are things that you could do in the spring, fall, even during the winter. Next, we have mechanical control practices. So this can be like physically removing a pest, trapping or excluding a pest. And then next we have biological. So biological control uses one species to reduce the adverse effect of another. So this can be like parasites, um, parasites, predators, or pathogens. And then lastly, we have our chemical control options. And we use this sparingly and only, and only if we determine if it's necessary. So this can include both organic and synthetic pesticide options. So as farmers, one thing we want to consider is an economic injury level. So the economic injury level um, is the lowest population density of a pest that will cause economic damage or the amount of pest injury which will justify the cost of control. And we compare that to our action threshold over here. And the action threshold is a pest density at which control measure, measures should be implemented to prevent it from reaching the economic injury level, the point where that economic loss um, occurs. So these are kind of two visuals to kind of explain that concept. And on a national level, there are some thresholds established for various pests and diseases that have been calculated for small acreage farmers. In Utah, we even have a few modeled for home orchards, but for vegetables, it's really fluid. And I think it's dependent on several factors. Um, like you, the small farmer, can decide a threshold for your own operation, depending on what you're growing, what you're wanting to sell. And we actually have this equation I put right here. And this is a really simplified version, but it's easy to see how you can consider the cost, um, the values and losses that can assist a pest manager in determining when the pest is actually causing an economic loss. Okay, so Cody just gave a whole talk on weed control. So this might be a little bit of a review, but I can tie it into like how it affects pests. But weeds themselves, I would consider them a pest as they can compete with our farms for crops, light, nutrients, and water. Um, so prevention, eradication, and control are the three general management strategies for weeds. And like Cody shared, USU Extension has a lot of specialists, tons of guides, videos, and other resources on weed identification and management. It's a whole separate rabbit hole you can go down. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that various weed species growing on our farm can serve as an alternate host for different arthropod and pathogens. So for example, the red, um, the red root pigweed, so thistle, prickly lettuce, purslane, th those are all hosts for the tomato spotted wilt virus, which is spread by thrips. So you might be familiar with that virus. It affects obviously our tomatoes and a lot of other solanaceous crops and a lot of cut flowers can get that virus as well. And if you have a lot of weeds on your site, the weeds aren't going to express the symptoms as visible as a lot of our crops. So you may not even know these weeds have the virus. So if you just have a lot of weeds hanging out nearby, they could be harboring that virus and the thrips that spread it as well. There are a few ways that we can manage weeds. One tool that I started using last year is this wheel hoe. 
Um, it's a tool designed to quickly weave between rows with minimal effort. They can be fitted with various attachments that furrow, cultivate, or hoe soil and weeds. And these typically run for about $100 to $250. Um, I grow on about one fourth of an acre. So I like to use these plastic mulches of various colors, which are great not only for weed suppression, but also temperature management and soil moisture retention. These are best applied using a small tractor attachment. And then studies have found that silver or reflective plastic mulches are effective in deterring various pests or various insect pests. And the pricing, again, depends on the color and the amount. But um, I actually just bought some last week, a 4,000 foot roll of the standard black plastic that's about three feet wide can range from $125 to $200. And then weed, um, weed barrier or landscape fab fabric, which I just saw Cody talk about, is a more heavy, du heavy duty um, polypropylene material. It's good for long-term weed control as it can be used from season to season. Um, I actually <laughs> I just laid some out this morning for my um, cut flower research project. Um, this is good for walkways and you can even burn or cut holes into it for specific plants. And I found some for three feet wide, about 300 foot roll is $125. So it's a little bit more expensive than the plastic mulch. And then another one that I'm planning to do also at our site in between the plastic mulch rows is using um, hay or straw. Um, if it's about four to six, if it's laid four to six inches thick, it can make excellent mulch and weed control for vegetable crops. And you want to make sure if you do buy it, you want to source hay that's not contaminated with weed seeds. Um, if you use straw, look for um, source that also just doesn't have a lot of grains in it either just to prevent seeding something you don't want to and then of course you can manage weeds chemically you can use an herbicide which can be incorporated incorporated into the soil prior to planting and then the prices of herbicides is really variable okay so this is the one I always emphasize the most for people, especially in the fall, and that is post-season site cleanup. So most edible plants growing in our home vegetable gardens can have pretty serious diseases and or pest issues that overwinter on the site. And we can prevent that by removing all the leaves, stem and fruits um, and other plant parts after that first frost. And removing diseased plant debris reduces the risk of it sticking around for the next growing season. And then plant debris removal also eliminates overwintering sites for um, various insect pests and helps reduce insect populations. So I always feel like fall is a good time to add amendments like well-rotted manure, leaves, compost, and disease-free garden waste. Um, keyword disease free. These amendments add organic matter and benefit the soil and microorganisms and overall soil health. And then additionally, tilling can disrupt overwintering life stages of various pests that might be in the soil or the ground. So that includes like the egg, larva, pupa, or the adult stage. And I know tilling can be sometimes hard on the soil, but even just like gently turning it over or lightly disking it can cut back on some of those overwintering pet po or pest populations. So the next one's kind of fun. It's companion planting and trap cropping. So you guys might have heard these terms. Um, it's kind of I did a lot of research on just kind of making sure we have the correct definition because a lot of these times these terms are interchanged. But I think the best way to describe it is Intercropping is kind of our umbrella term. And this means growing two or more crops in close proximity to promote beneficial interactions between them. And then we have companion planting. And this refers to the establishment of two or more species in close proximity so that 
some cultural benefits such as pest control or an increased yield may be achieved. And then trap cropping involves growing plants alongside a target crop that are more appealing to certain pests, thereby protecting the plant. So last year at the Urban Homestead Expo, I actually did a whole webinar on, or a class on companion planting and trap cropping. And you can actually go back and watch that. That's about 30 minutes long. And that's available on our USU Extension YouTube channel. It's called Companion Planting and Trap Cropping. And I dive into a lot of different techniques and methods. And it's a really fun, interesting topic. But if you're considering it for your own site, I have three things that you need to ask yourself to really decide if it's going to work or not. And that's first determine if the pest you're trying to control is actually present at your site. And then you want to determine what specific cash crop you're trying to protect and the specific problems associated with it. And then lastly, you want to ensure that the timing of the trap crop's growth will attract the damaging life stage of the pests that you're trying to control. So those are kind of the critical things to note with companion and trap cropping. Okay, so this is a big important one you wanna pay attention, um, and that's soil-borne diseases. So soil is a reservoir for many plant pathogens, and plants are under regular attack by these soil-borne organisms. Um, if inoculum levels are high enough and environmental conditions become fa favorable for infection, susceptible plants will develop disease. Soil-borne pathogens are readily spread if infested soil or contaminated water moves into the field or planting areas. So some examples of soil-borne diseases that we see here in Utah include various wilts, crown, stem, and root rots caused by specific species of Fusarium, Verticillium, Pythothera, Pythium, Rhizocotonia, and a lot more. So sadly, once a plants are infected, they cannot be treated and they should be removed. Um, it's important to use cultural control practices to prevent introduction of the disease and improve the soil health. Um, soil solarization using plastic can be an option if the soil can be heated to at significant depths. Um, soil solarization is not something that's really used on a wide scale in small farms, especially here in Utah, because it requires giving up a significant amount of space for the entire season. And this method may also be harmful to beneficial microorganisms in our soils. Um, however, the California IPM program has some good literature on using it for small farms. So if you're interested in that, that's something I can share. Um, the next one is cover crops. So especially those in the mustard family have been shown to have biofumigation properties due to the high presence of glucosinolates. Um, but the research on this is relatively new. There is some literature from Michigan State University where they're looking at using mustards for the biofumigation properties. Um, a lot of homeowners or commercial producers can graft their own plants on. So basically, grafting combines a disease-resistant rootstock, like shown here, with a scion with the chosen desired qualities of the fruit. Um, when I was an undergraduate at the University of Nebraska, I worked with Estamino and Maxifort tomato varieties which are relatively disease resistant rootstocks for some heirloom varieties. So I should, um, so those are the varieties that we use and a lot of them are still used today for tomato grafting. And then finally, you can actually purchase seeds that are pre-treated with fungicides. And this can really help give your plants a fighting chance when they're newly germinating. And I think the product that most of the time, it's thorough is the product that's used. Okay, so the next one is crop rotation. So um, 
I don't think we had any presenters on crop rotation today, but we do have a video where one of our county faculty presented on crop rotation for small farms. So that's a really good resource to use. But essentially, um, it's something that we can use for, again, like the soil borne diseases that we we're talking about. And basically, it's rotating land out of out of susceptible crops and can be an effective and relatively inexpensive means for managing soil borne diseases. To successfully use crop rotation for disease management, um, you got to requ requires understanding the life cycle of the disease causing organism. And then for crop rotation to control an insect pest, the insect must spend the period from the end of one crop to the beginning of the next in a stage with low mobility and must have restricted range of host plants. And unfortunately, not a lot of insects has fit this pattern. So crop rotation is something you see kind of like in this picture between like soybeans and corn on large scale operations. So it's still hard to measure its effectiveness on a small scale, but nevertheless, it's still kind of an interesting concept and definitely can have benefits. So the next one that I think is important is your cultivar selection. So plants with tolerance or resistance to various arthropods diseases can be bred for through selected traits, or sometimes they could be genetically engineered, um, as we see with some like agronomic crops like our rice, corn, and wheat. Um, Resistant means a plant with resistance has certain characteristics that make pathogens less likely to enter the plant and to reproduce on or in that plant. And then a plant with tolerance means that they can still become infected with the pathogen, but the damage will be a lot less severe than a susceptible plant. So I think a lot of you guys may have bought your seeds already, but if you're still out getting seeds, you can always look on the seed packet labels for um, any indication that a plant might have resistance to specific diseases or not. So here's a University of California trial where they were looking at different um, varieties of strawberries. So this field was known to have, I think it was Pythothera in it. So they were testing different varieties and you can see that this variety on the right had significant resistance to the disease compared to the ones on the left and around it. So this is just kind of a good visual that they do develop varieties that are more resilient. So the next thing we have is water management. So um, sadly, most plant diseases are caused by fungi and bacteria that spread via, so um, via spores or cells. Um, the fungals, or that can buy the water, I meant to say. The fungal spores or bacteria and bacterial cells are often not released until they have been wet for a certain amount of period. And then once released, they can be carried on by the wind and the raindrops or irrigation water. Um, splashing water droplets move pathogens short distances. The splash, uh, the splash carries the spores from the soil to the lower plant leaves, from the lower plant leaves to the upper plant leaves, and from one plant to another. Um, the spores may move a longer distance by the wind blown water droplets. So, we can actually prevent diseases by just having good water management. So we want to always avoid overhead watering our plants. Um, instead, we should opt for drip irrigation, which I think most Utah producers do anyway. Um, you can irrigate in the morning to allow the plant canopy to dry out during the heat of the day. And then of course you can avoid standing water in the field. So here's a photo where there's a lot of water, even the plants are just laying in it. So this is just asking for a lot of disease problems right here. 
So next I want to touch on trapping for pests. So there's different ways that we can physically trap, right? We can use pheromone traps. And this works because insects communicate with each other using a chemical substance that they produce called pheromones. Pheromones of some vegetable, um, vegetable pests have been synthesized and are actually available to purchase in a lure for monitoring traps. So you can see here, this is what a, a lure looks like. It's like a little rubber eraser type thing. And then here's a Japanese beetle trap from UDAF, and you can see the lure right there as well. Um, so primarily, or sorry, pheromone traps are primarily used for different moss species, including the corn earworm, cutworm, armyworms, diamondback moths, cabbage loopers, and a lot more. Um, there are online sources where you can purchase sticky traps along with the pheromone lures in small amounts. I've seen them run for about $5 to $25. And then, of course, you can use mechanical traps to physically catch a uh, vertebrae pests like here. So this can be like gophers, moles, voles, or any other small rodent problems. Um, there are lethal and non-lethal traps options you can use. And if you are trying to manage rodents or other wildlife on your farm, you want to reference your local laws and regulations to determine what is legal or not legal in terms of the management, removal, and relocation. So next we have some more physical exclusion. Or sorry, so next we have physical exclusion with row covers. So um, row covers are transparent or semi-transparent materials that are used to cover crops, typically are vegetables for a variety of purposes, and they work because they act as a physical barrier to prevent the movement of pests such as insects, birds, and mammals to our host plants. They form, um, this form of management is popular in organic production because it obviously avoids chemical application. Um, a couple of years ago when I started in this position, I did a lot of work with row covers for pest exclusion with farms across the state. And on our YouTube, USU, U, sorry, our USU Extension YouTube channel, you can find um, a construction tutorial video. And last year for the Homestead Expo, I did another class on using row covers for pest control. So these are two great resources that you can watch if you really want to dive deep into how these work. A few common brands of the spun bound fabric include Agrabon and Rime. There are different grades or thicknesses available that you can purchase. And then the pricing, like I've shown here, is just dependent on the grade of material and then the amount that you purchase. So some other physical exclusion options can include, obviously, fences. When designed and set up correctly, fences will provide 100% exclusion. So these are obviously um, used for large vertebrae press, like our deer, elk, dogs, cats, um, raccoons, and even children. And then, of course, the cost is variable and dependent on the material and then the amount of the material. So an interesting one for um, our fruit growers and even some vegetables is bagging your fruits. So this is an excellent way to exclude various insect pests like the cherry flies, collie moss, and twig borers all season long. And here's some photos just showing it. You just wrap the bag around the developing fruit. And then I saw on Amazon, you can get about 100 bags for about $17. So this is kind of a really effective way to physically exclude some pests. So the next one that, um, or sorry, the next one is baits. And a lot of insects and arthropod pests can be managed using different food baits. So basically a bait consists of a mixture or a substance that attracts insects and sometimes an insecticide to kill them. So for example, 
earwigs, pill bugs, and springtails can be baited using a thick oil substance with a smelly substance like soy sauce. So this is a trap that we set up last year where we just used a little plastic yogurt container and we buried it soil level into the ground and then just used vegetable oil along with some soy sauce. And we found this to be very effective. Um, slugs and snails can be baited using iron phosphate or yeast products. And you can use the same kind of trap set up as seen here. And grasshoppers can be baited with wheat-laced carbaryl, or um, there's a organic product called Nosema leucustate. So those are really effective for the young grasshopper limbs. And this past winter, I've been saving a lot of plastic and metal containers that we'll be using to make our own bait stations at our extension demonstration farm. So this next one, a lot of people get excited about, it's pur purchasing beneficial insects. So this is obviously biological control because um, it uses the activity of one species to reduce the adverse effect of another. So in pest management, this can include parasites, predators, or pathogens of a pest population. So a few years ago, I actually had some of my colleagues put together two webinars where they actually go really in depth to all the beneficial insects that we have here in Utah, along with their identification and their use. Um, and these can be again found on our USU Extension YouTube channel. So we have one on beetles and true bugs, and then one on flies and wasps. And the cool thing about beneficial insects is you can actually purchase them from various sources. Um, I listed some of the examples here. Um, however, releasing beneficials is often more conductive to enclosed spaces like a greenhouse or high tunnel, as beneficials tend to disperse after being released. However, you can always promote naturally occurring beneficials through habitat plantings on your farm. So the next one is synthetic pesticides. So if it is determined that a pesticide is needed for treatment, you can be aware that for insects and many diseases, treatments should be applied only during the time period when the most susceptible life stage is active. Um, in addition, if symptoms of feeding are found, but no casual insect can be identified, um, a chemical spray is usually not recommended. So pesticides are grouped by their mode of action, which means how they kill the target organism, which is usually designated by a group number. Rotating among pesticides and different group numbers will reduce the likelihood of pest resistance. And then, of course, we have different organic pesticides. So organic pesticides derive from natural sources and are minimally processed. These natural sources are usually plants um, such as neem, pyrethrum, rhodotene, or ranaya, or they can be from different minerals such as boric acid, diatomaceous earth, and then there's even microbial pesticides out there. Um, OMRI, O-M-R-I, which is the Organic Materials Review Institute. It's a nonprofit organization that um, reviews fertilizers, pesticides for certified organic production and processing. So there's a lot of options out there as well for organic process or organic pesticides. So I'm gonna go over now some of our resources that we have on our website, but our website, you can definitely bookmark it on your phone. It's extension.usu.edu slash pest. And I'll show you how to navigate this here in a second. But I do wanna plug some events that we have coming up. So right now you guys are watching our Urban Homestead Expo virtually. But this summer, we're going to have a series of in-person workshops um, at the Wheeler Historic Farm in Murray. 
And July 11th, I'll actually be presenting. I'll be down there. So if you guys want to come, we're going to talk some more about vegetable pest management. And we're going to go, we're going to deep dive into some of the specific insects we want to look out for, how to ID them and manage them. And then we'll actually go out on the farm site there and we'll actually practice scouting and looking for and identifying different pests. So mark your calendars. This will be a really fun evening down at the historic farm. So July 11, 6.30 to 8.30. And then our IPM program, we're hosting our vegetable twilight meetings. So these are also virtual via Zoom and they're every other Tuesday at 7 p.m. So if you go to our website, you can see the full schedule of different topics that we have. So now, I just want to show you guys our website. So this is extension.usu.edu, or sorry, extension.usu.edu slash pest. Um, so this is like a good starting point if you have any questions about different problems you might have in your garden. Um, the first place you can look is check out all our books and guides. So these are all publications written by um, our USU faculty experts. They cover various topics such as beneficial insects, fruits, and other vegetables. Um, so you can just see some here. This one might be of interest for you guys. So this is on abiotic disorders of tomato pet or tomato crops. So we basically cover everything that can go wrong with your tomatoes that's not um, a disease or insect. So these are all weather nutrient deficiencies, but we have lots of photos on how you can identify them, the time of year they are a problem. So this is a really good guidebook that you guys can check out. And I have been distributing a lot of these to the different county offices. So you can stop by and see if they have any copies available that you can pick up. But if not, it's free on our website. And then of course we have our fact sheets. So we recently just organized these. So they're really user friendly. So if you have um, a problem with, let's say squash bugs, on your cucurbit crops. You can go to our insects on our vegetable page, and then you can scroll down and you can find our squash bug content. And there's a lot of information about the biology, the injury symptoms you can look for, and how to management. So this is really good if you wanna learn about um, different specific insects or pests. And then we have our videos. So the videos are really great because these are short, they're less than 10 minutes and um, our experts are out there showing you different topics. So last year we put one together on grasshoppers and how we can manage them. But you can just find lots of different ones for our vegetables, fruit and other ornamentals. That's really good. So another website that I have put together is our Utah Vegetable Production and Pest Management Guide. So this was put together by myself and Dr. Dan Dross and a lot of others on our team. But this is really good for small and urban farmers along with our commercial farmers. So we dive into all the different crop groups. And so if you're interested in growing leafy greens, you can read more about how to do that on a commercial scale. And then we also have the different pests that you can read about and how to manage them. But one of the most helpful things is our pesticide tables. So this includes all the products sorted by active ingredients, um, the brand name, mode of action, and the different pests that, that they control. We're actually going through right now, some of my interns and I, and we're actually going through and updating all of these. So we're hoping by later this spring and summer that we'll have this all updated and ready for individuals to use and reference. So this website's a really great tool to use. 